Hello? Oh, sorry. It's my other cell phone. It's my Blackberry. It's my mom. Sorry about that. Uh, maybe we'll just let that go to voicemail. All right, so um, what do these two devices, a telephone and a Blackberry, have in common besides being telephones? Anybody? Oh, we got a smart class here. Well, let me make it a little more difficult. What do um, these two um, devices um, <laughs> have in common? The Wonder Bra and the Jock Strap. And unfortunately, my slides have jumped ahead of me. Any ideas? Well, if you said Canadian inventions for those two as well, you'd be correct. Well, good morning, class. I am Professor Mark Rector, and I have been studying the history of Canadian inventions for about 18 years now. And I actually wrote a book called O Canada, Our Home and Inventive Land, with the stories of numerous Canadian inventions, and they're very, very inspiring stories. So I'm going to start today's class with a pop quiz. Can anybody name either of these two very accomplished Canadians? Nobody? Class, you're going to have to study a little bit harder. <laughs> Let me introduce you to Matthew Evans and Owen Maynard. Now, Owen Maynard actually designed the lunar lander for the Apollo missions. Now, that's right. Without him, NASA wouldn't have had a leg to stand on. And I managed to find, by digging deep in the NASA archives, the unphotoshopped original of this famous iconic photograph of Neil Armstrong and the lunar lander on the moon's surface. This is the version NASA did not want you to see. And Matthew Evans, well, he actually invented the light bulb. Yes, it's a Canadian invention. Matthew Evans and Henry Woodward invented the light bulb, the Morrison Brass Company in downtown Toronto in July of 1874. They, uh, and there is the actual Canadian patent office record from uh, 1874, August 3rd of 1874. And you may differ with me and you may say it was Thomas Edison. No, what Thomas Edison did was he bought the patent from Matthew Evans and Henry Woodward. And six months after he did this, the headline was, Edison invents light bulb. Fake news, people, fake news. Edison didn't invent a light bulb, he bought a light bulb from two Canadians. All right, let's try this pop quiz again. I'll give you another chance. Can any of you name either of these two uh, very accomplished Canadian inventors? And they obviously highlight our great diversity in this country and in my book. Anybody? Oh, class. Let me introduce you to Elijah McCoy and Elsie McGill. Now, Elsie McGill was the very first woman to get a bachelor's of electrical engineering in Canada. And she was diagnosed with polio before she finished the degree. She went on to get her master's in aeronautical engineering, and then the very first woman to get a PhD from MIT. Pretty inspiring, considering the doctors told her she wouldn't walk. She actually walked across that stage to get her three degrees herself under her own power with her cane she designed herself. She was the only person in history to single-handedly design an airplane, and there it is, the Maple Leaf II. This woman wasn't disabled, she was inspiring. And I think a very good inspiration for our young female students to go into the STEM careers of science, technology, engineering, and math. Now, Elijah McCoy, the uh, son of uh, black slaves who escaped to Canada on the Underground Railroad, he actually invented the automatic oil lubricator for locomotives after he was an oil man on the trains for a while. The train engineers, after the other companies started making cheap knockoffs, well, the train engineers insisted they wanted the real McCoy for their engines, and hence that's where that phrase comes from. Let me introduce you to some uh, Atlantic Canadian inventors. Abraham Pinio Gessner, he didn't do much. He invented something called kerosene A, B, and C. Uh, and as well, started this museum. Kerosene A is actually what we use in kerosene lamps. It replaced whale oil. So this guy was saving the whales and going green back in 1850. Kerosene C is what you and I call gasoline. So without him, Otto Benz and Henry Ford, they weren't going anywhere. Whoops. Uh, the other fellow up there on the right, Robert Fuller, St. John's, New Brunswick. Yes, he invented the steam foghorn, the very first one installed right here in St. John's Harbor, Partridge Island. And let me tell you about Walter Harris Kalu from Parsboro, Nova Scotia. He was maimed in World War I. He was a blind quadriplegic lying helpless in a veteran's hospital bed. And so what he decided to do, his mission in life, was to make the lives of the other wounded veterans better. 
He uh, gets a couple of engineers. He puts together a board of directors and raises the money. And they design the uh, wheelchair bus, the very first wheelchair bus, so that the other wounded vets could get out and enjoy the scenery, the scenery that Walter Harris Kalu couldn't see. How inspiring and selfless is that? Pretty strong. Now, let me tell you about my favorite maritimer, Alexander Graham Bell. Now, uh, Bell um, is known for the telephone, as you know. And I call him my favorite Canadian or Nova Scotian, but a lot of people argue he's not Canadian. Well, he was uh, emigrated to Canada as a young man. He conceived of the telephone in Brantford, Ontario. And then he moved to Nova Scotia and lived out most of the rest of his 37 years of life inventing many other things that nobody knows about, including the metal detector to save the life of an American president, the iron lung, and numerous other things. And there's the schematic that started it all, the original patent schematic from August of 1876. And the idea came to Bell on the banks of the Grand River uh, behind his house here. This is his boy at home. And he was throwing pebbles into the water. 25 years later, further up that Grand River, young Reginald Fessenden comes up with the idea for radio carrier waves throwing pebbles into the same river. Two inventors in Ontario are both inspired by the same river to come up with telephone and radio, the two underlying technologies in our modern day high speed gigabit handsets that we all carry around. And I was very inspired by that story. In fact, that was the story that made me write the book. And I called that chapter the creators of our modern age about Bell and Fessenden, our two most important inventors. Um, so when I did the research for my, my book, I actually went and met with Bell's surviving family members, toured the house, and had access to his 600 volumes of lab notes and letters and every single gadget and prototype he made. And one of the things I found in those archives was this vinyl record that he made when he was improving on Edison's design of the gramophone. Let me take you back in time to 1885 and you are going to hear the actual real voice of Alexander Graham Bell. You can follow along with the words at the bottom of the slide. So what does the guy do after he makes millions inventing the telephone and perfecting the gramophone? Well, he moves to Nova Scotia and he starts what's called the Aerial Experimentation Association, the AEA. And he formed this with two U of T physics grads, uh, Douglas, um, or sorry, Frederick Casey Baldwin and Douglas McCurdy. And what were they trying to do? They were trying to perfect heavier than air craft. Yes, he actually outdoes those other famous airplane inventors by trying to make airplanes more stable and safer by inventing the ailerons or the flaps that you see on the wings of airplanes. And that was Alexander Graham Bell's invention. And he did that because one of his AEA boys was actually killed in the very first aviation fatality crash in, a, in one of the Wright brothers' planes trying to help them. The very first powered flight takes place on, uh, outside of Bell's property in Bedeck, Nova Scotia, when uh, they fly the actual silver dart. There it is, designed by Bell and his boys. And they flew 40 flights in and around and over Bredore Lake up in Cape Breton. This is only a few months after the Wright brothers did the first public demonstration of their airplane that lasted a minute and a half. February 23rd, 1909. Pretty amazing. And let me tell you now about the most prolific and important Canadian inventor that nobody knows, Reginald Aubrey Fessenden. In 1876, as a 10-year-old, Fessenden is inspired by Bell's work, and he wants to send his voice wirelessly across the sky without using those silly wires of Bell. 
And so he goes on to invent radio and broadcasting in December of 1900. He then goes on to come up with more than 500 other patents, including sonar, the electrical conduit, and many others. Uh, his first broadcast to multiple people was on December 23rd, 1906. Telegraph operators on the ships in the Atlantic are listening, and they hear the inventor singing Christmas carols when they're expecting the dee dee the dee dee of Morse code. Let me take you back in time again to a simulation of that very first test that Tefessenden did, putting a human voice on a radio wave, December 23rd, 1900. Is it any surprise that the very first words uttered on a radio wave by a Canadian, and he's asking about the weather? <laughs> All right, how many James Bond fans we got in the audience? All right, so you probably know that Ian Fleming wrote the James Bond series and the movies. What you probably don't know is he was actually a real spy from World War II, and he was recruited to train at a spy training school set up by Sir William Stevenson of Winnipeg. Where was that spy training school? Just outside of Toronto, Camp X, there it is, was uh, set up outside of Toronto to teach espionage, explosives, coded communications. It was so secret that the prime minister knew nothing about it. And they actually trained the very first recruits of the CIA here at Camp X in Canada. Now, when Ian Fleming was there, he stayed at the barracks, but not these barracks. He stayed at a military barracks in Toronto. And what was across the street? from that military barracks, the St. James Bond United Church. <laughs> I think we found the inspiration for the James Bond name. So there might be a little Canadian content in that famous British spy. And now let me tell you an inspiring story about four unbelievably amazing students. They came to me in 2007 in my electronics class and said, we want to do a big world's first project similar to all these Canadian inventors and all these firsts you've been telling us about in our own country. And so they came up with a truly incredible project. In fact, it was way, way out of their league and way beyond the skills that they had at the time. But we set to work for two solid years, working dozens and dozens of extra hours to learn the materials for me to teach them and building the equipment. And their project was literally out of this world. Were they successful? Well, let's take a look. And up next, this. Getting through. Checking in from Humber College, schedule contact, do you copy? Some Canadian students make a phone call that redefines long distance. Well, they better get an A for this. Four Toronto students have boldly gone where no homework has gone before. Today, they made contact with the International Space Station. In a way, their teachers are calling a first. Joanna Romiliotis has the story. One small college. No, no, actually, leave it live for this point now. Don't change anything. One giant technological leap. E minus nine minutes. Four students and a professor on a shoestring budget and a dream that defied the skeptics, including themselves. It's such a huge deal. Like, if talking to space was something easy to do, surely everyone would be doing it. And then, yeah, that's beautiful. They were, after all, shooting for the stars. The first college students to design and build a radio system that would make live voice contact contact with an astronaut aboard the International Space Station. They had $4,000 to do it. NASA does this all the time. They talk to space with a $100 billion budget and an entire boatload of engineers that would fill the Titanic. Undaunted, the students worked 100-hour weeks for nearly two years. Then it came down to the final nerve-wracking test. They only had 10 minutes to find the ISS signal and speak to the astronaut before the space station hurtled out of range at nearly 27,000 kilometers an hour. After a few last-second technical glitches, the team sent their signal into space at about 12.29 Eastern Time today. Four, three, two, one. We're live. And in one assess, this is VA3JUV Humber College checking in for scheduled contact. Do you copy? 
First try, no response. NA1 SS, this is V. Then the voice from outer space. Checking in from American astronaut Sandra Magnus. I almost wet myself. I won't lie to you. Paul J was simply overcome. Wow, this really worked. Because NASA, they don't give they don't give second tries. They say it works or not. Amateur radio experts who work with NASA call it a hit. I know the people at NASA are looking at this one and going, scratching their head, going, "Wow, that's really uh, something." As for the students, they're still recovering and hoping this means finding a job when they graduate just got easier. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. I inspired those boys with the stories that I'd been telling them for years from my book. And there's over 170 other inspiring stories of Canadian ingenuity uh, in that book that nobody knows. So please, class, I ask you, if you can just remember one thing, that we are the second largest landmass. We are the first nation of hockey, and we invented it in Windsor, Nova Scotia at King's College. We are the best part of North America, and we are the most inventive country in the world. I'm Professor Mark Rector. I hope I've inspired you. Thank you very much.